hello, welcome to the 72nd episode of the Online Tennis Podcast. Out of nowhere, I am very honoured to tell you I'm joined by Pam Shriver. Pam, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's an exciting time in tennis. I mean, the WTA Tour Finals was fascinating to watch. I was able to watch every one of the singles matches plus the doubles final and um, tomorrow I get to go to work and call uh, four days of the Billie Jean King Cup. Um, so it seems like this sport of ours never never takes a break. Yeah, sorry, totally forgot to give you the introduction there. Everybody knows who Pam Shriver is. I, I, I shouldn't really need to, of course, but in case you're not sure, 22 grand, time Grand Slam champion, 10 time WTA final champion, Pam. And uh, this year you've had a, a group named after you as well. How do you, do you feel about that? Well, in the group, uh, you know, Mertens and Kudermantova came out of group Shriver and uh, we thumped group uh, Rosie Casals in the finals. The Czech team are such a great team and obviously... Uh, Krajcikova and Siniakova had an amazing year winning the, all three majors they played in. They couldn't play in Roland Garros, but, you know, I thought the doubles was fun to follow as well. But I was particularly impressed with the two players who got to the singles final. I think uh, Garcia and Sabalenka have fascinating stories for the year. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we'll dive into that. As soon as possible, the very first thing I wanted to talk about, though, and we're going to do a bit of sort of back and forth here, but the, the first two players I wanted to talk about were the Americans on the single side, because uh, Coco Goff and Jessica Pagula had a fairly disappointed run, disappointing run, to say the least. I mean, love six overall, love three in the singles for both of them, love three in the doubles for the two of them. Pam, you did say, I listened to a little bit of what you did on the tennis podcast, and you were saying the conditions maybe should have suited Coco's game. Uh, have you got a, a bit of an elaboration on that, maybe? Yeah, listen, I mean, it's funny. In the tennis podcast that I recorded before sort of doing a preview, I picked the field to not Shiontek. I thought, you know, I thought it would be a good chance one of the other seven would win it. I thought the Americans would play better, but I kind of underestimated the fatigue factor for two players who had not yet ever played in the year-ending championship. And what was interesting is that the four semifinalists, you know, there were four people, four players who'd played it one other time. The other four players were making their debut. It was the most inexperienced group to have, in my knowledge, to have ever collectively played a WTA tour final. Mm -hmm. And I think I underestimated like being a rookie to the round robin format, the round robin format, if you've never done it before, it's, it's really new and different. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I think both of them went in tired. And then once like Pagula lost twice the opening night, generally you're done. So I think it, it takes some um, experience to know in round robin format, how you have to press the reset button. And mm -hmm. I just think coming out of, in the case of, um, you know, Pagula winning her biggest ever title in Guadalajara at altitude, even though it was eight days prior, I don't think she recovered. She looked tired. She looked grumpy. I think she seemed to indicate she was a little bit sick as well. And Coco, you know, whether or not they kind of fed off each other during the year, both positively and sometimes your partner, you can kind of go where they go. And I don't know, Coco didn't play well either. So I was on the one hand a little, I was obviously, I thought they'd do better. But then once I saw it unfold and kind of like thought about it, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I, 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 loads of stuff to, to sort of add on to there. Because when you say that and you, you put it like that, it's, 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 it seems really clear. It's like Goff started with Caroline Garcia and actually played a decent-ish match. For me, it felt like Garcia just had a more polished version of, of uh, Goff's game in some way. She was the one that was able to come forward a bit better. I've always thought Goff was quite, quite a good transition game, pretty decent in the net. But Garcia was doing that so much better than her the whole week, serving better than her the whole week as well. I feel like the serve never really turned up outside of that match also able to be more aggressive on the forehand, maybe still a short pulling slightly of golf. But in the end, yeah, four and three seemed fair, but it was still fairly close. And then you look at Kasatkina, the second match that golf had, which is generally, it's a, it's a matchup that's not been kind to golf over the years. That first serve just comes back, it comes back, it comes back. Golf has to find some way of finishing off the point outside of baseline exchanges, basically. And by the end of the first set, golf was fried. I mean, there was a few points that maybe should have went her way. They didn't. She just looked distraught by the end yeah. of the first set. She was. And then, uh, yeah, Kasatkina kind of ran away with it. And then by the time Schwantek came along, right, 
it was like golf didn't have anything left in the tank. She was there for a while, and then Schwantek kind of ran away with it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's no other there's no other event where you put yourself on the line. You can play six times and lose six matches. I mean, it's crazy yeah. to have that happen in a seven day period for Coco Golf. That she she'd never experienced anything like that. So um, I, I the thing that concerned me about watching Coco Golf is that I'm, I'm like curious what her intent is with her serve. Uh, I mean, listen, I know she can have some flaws with the second serve, but the first serve's been, you know, a big weapon when, especially indoors. So I think what I envisioned beforehand was, you know, I saw her serving at the U.S. Open under tougher outdoor conditions where she was serving like 120 to 125. She was getting free points with enough first serves. And I thought it would go even more indoors where there's none of the conditions to worry about. That was always one of my favorite serving conditions. So I thought, I thought Coco really underperformed with her serve. And if she were just to watch the finals between Sabalenka and Garcia, a match that certainly the server did not underperform one break point, uh, you know, the first set 12 straight holds before the tie break. And then obviously Sabalenka's two double faults in the first set tie break proved to be really costly but one break point for an entire final. And I feel like Coco Goff should watch that match and see the intent that Garcia and um, Sabalenka had with their first serve and even second serve. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very good point. Zooming a little bit ahead there, Pam. I love it because I've got so much to say in that final. But you're quite right, Goff. It feels like doesn't capitalize on her own first serves a lot of the time. Certainly with somebody like Kasatkina as well. That was just exemplified in a way. A quick segue, by the way, Goff was uh, heard saying this year, she thought Demi Schurz has the best volleys and movement in the game. Any <clears> thoughts on that? Is that true? I figured you would have a fairly good opinion on this, Pam. Well, I, I know that Demi Schurz has an amazing reputation to become a double specialist and the way she moves around the net with her confidence. Um, I can see, you know, if you play somebody enough times in doubles, you, you really understand their strengths and that is Demi's strength but I don't know if I you know I don't think there's a really long list of great volleyers in the women's game right now I kind of feel like that's an area of growth in the coming time I feel mm -hmm. like the volleying was better because of the equipment hadn't you know the string hadn't revolutionized um, the power of the game was different but there were much better volleyers um, in more numbers back when I played than there is now, but it's kind of because people have been, because of the pace and everything and the spin and the RPMs, they've been pushed back a little bit, but I do see some volleying and some more forward movement occurring. So maybe it'll, maybe it'll change in the coming time. That's really interesting, Pam. Yeah. Putting golf and Pigula to the side for a while, moving on to the semifinals that did eventually qualify, starting with Igor Schwantek. And I know you were talking about the field maybe being above Igor Schwantek at the start of the, the week for you in terms of a pegging order. And and for me, I, I would agree, indoors, Schwantek's got a lot to, to still improve, right? Obviously, the serve is the, the main thing for me. And you look at Caroline Garcia and Sablenka, the two, and Sakari as well, actually. The, the, the three other semi finalists and Iga is missing that at the same time. She, you know, she went three love in her round robin. For me, Kasatkina is a pretty bad matchup. Uh, Kasatkina is a uh, Schwantek's a bad matchup for Kasatkina, I should say, because Schwantek's almost like a, a sort of two point oh version of Kasatkina in a way. Everything Kasatkina does, Schwantek just does a little bit better. One of the best point constructors in the game, Kasatkina, but Schwantek is the best point constructor in the game. Is that a fair assessment? Do you think? And three and two was probably about as good as Kasatkina could have done. Yeah, I, you know, it's it's funny when I think about Kasatkina's game and Shviantek's game. I wouldn't necessarily um, compare them much at all, but I can see your point. That the, the thing that I, I watched a lot of Shviantek, both um, actually in person in San Diego when I drove down, it was close to my home in LA. I wasn't working, and I saw her play, especially the finals. Um, and then to see her play all four of her matches, even the one she lost, she's extremely professional in everything she does. She's impeccable with her movement. She's got the great athleticism. She's obviously all in with mindset training, physical training, making sure the schedule is just right. Was willing to give up Madrid and Guadalajara, two 1000s, take zero pointers because she didn't feel she wanted to play at altitude. It didn't fit in right with her um, scheduling. 
So they let it go because they're looking at the big picture. Like, and I think that's something that a lot of players can learn from. So even though she lost to Sabalenko, I thought played, you know, the best match I'd seen her play in a long time. Sviantec mm-hmm. was still really impressive to not to, to win, you know, all three of her round robins is easily given how tiring her year must have been. Um, she's really impressive. And all the players have a lot of work to do. The, the ones that are in the top 10 who want to get to the top 10, there's a lot of work to do to catch up to the professionalism, the talent, and leaving no stone unturned attitude of Sviantec. Yeah. I think, yeah, the, the way she talks about her serve and she knows it's still such a massive improvement and being world number one at the same time and finding the motivation still to do that is really, really impressive. Um, a, a touch on Chuante Garcia for me because going into that match, I thought Garcia was one of the few players that, that could have bothered Chuante this week, obviously after Warsaw and how well she'd returned her serve there. Able to take the second serve early, even on the, sort of the, the, the unpredictable clay of Warsaw and the kick, obviously, that Chuante puts in her serve. I thought... Uh, that may be less of a factor, the sort of kickiness of the serve indoors here, and Garcia would get a better read on it. However, I mean, Garcia played well for a while, but then, you know, the returns started to go out. She was going too big. Schwantek, so good nowadays at getting low in the court and absorbing that pace, and it was almost like, okay, Garcia, you know, uh, to be fair, I think Schwantek lost for different reasons and more so, but had Garcia played Schwantek a year ago, I think that sort of play would have worked sort of nine times out of ten nowadays. Schwantek is one of the best pace absorbers in the game. Yeah. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, that? I think she does so many things well. Yes. Um, but I, I think of all her strengths that I look at physically about her game, it's how quickly she moves forward to get in position for short balls. Like because her forehand obviously is is you know the best ground stroke in women's tennis right now. The backhand is improved. Um, she just gets a lot of opportunities where people are uh, uncomfortable and kind of are playing defense and she never, she, she's looking to rob every split second away from the opponent. And uh, you can see that with her attitude, with her footwork, you know, there's like a, you know, there's sort of like a, a desperate, um, flurry of footwork that goes into each shot that just gets her in the right position. And I, I think that a lot of other players can learn can learn from that. Yeah, and you can hear it indoors as well, obviously. Yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's, 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 uh, there's an ASMR stuff on YouTube. you got to check that out, Pam. It's very good. Yeah, anyway, Sean Tech did well. I'll talk about the semi properly in a second, but Sabalenka, I'll talk about her run to get to the semis in general and just her year. And, oh, my God, Sabalenka could be the story of the year for me, honestly. That, you know, just like starting the year – with all those double faults in Australia, could barely put the serve in the court, eventually crapping and clawing her way through, you know, the most deciding sets of any player this year. Has played more deciding set matches than straight set matches, by the way. The only player to do that. Survives at the start of the week against Shabur. She was down 4-2 and a couple of break points against, ironically, or I don't know, fittingly, whatever you want to call it, those two break points were saved with second serve plus ones, you know, huge second serves, didn't go out, didn't double fault. And then at the end of the week, obviously, the semi, the final, I'll talk about that properly in a second, but the second serve performance there was phenomenal. And it, it's just, sure it's, was. It's, it's incredible that this has happened. And honestly, I am jumping ahead, but Sabalenka couldn't really, for me, have played a better final. And Garcia came through. Yeah, no, I thought Sabalenka played a great final. Take the tie break aside. Um, I, I loved how brave she was on her second serve. Um, obviously, that that being bold and brave that helped her play a great final set the night before against Fiontech. She continued with that bold serving and aggressive um, mindset to hold serve. Um, it's just that she happened to be playing against someone in Garcia that could even do it not a lot better. I mean, just, but one break point better. Yeah. Um, and that's not a lot in a final. <laughs> so yeah. I was thoroughly entertained. I love matches where the serve hold is valued. Mm-hmm. And I felt like both those players with the matches they would played with their season, the way they got there, they went into that final wanting to hold serve each and every time they, they, 
took the tennis balls and I, I, I appreciate that attitude. Yes, so did I. It was a, it's an incredible story. Maria Sakkari was the other person that came through the round robin free love. Maria Sakkari, also a really interesting story, despite getting ma- uh, knocked out in those semis, because I don't think many people expected her to do particularly well. Obviously, hadn't come into the, the finals with a, a title to show, not with a particularly great top 10 record either. But for those round robin matches, she did, you know, she, obviously she was free love, but she was the second best player for me, for sure. Um, the way she defended her forehand against Arena in particular was incredible. I mean, Arena couldn't find a way through her for me. Um, and it's ironic, again, because people call the forehand the, the weakness, right? But it, it, it seems to... How do you describe Maria's forehand, I should say, Pam? Because it's um, an oddity. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, it's hard to put it into a, a category. I mean, Spiontek's sort of the forehand's right there, just so easy to like hit you right in the forehand every time you see it whether you're a player or you're watching it i feel like sakari's forehand on on her good days is like really solid one of the best but i feel like at other times i saw it in san diego first round i just happened to go down actually to i was trying to connect with donna vekic on a few things really player wta player council related and they drew each other first round so i watched the match otherwise i probably wouldn't have watched the match and the forehand on that particular day was all over the place. So, um, you know, and that's the thing that makes Sviantec, I think, so special is like what she she had a bad final set against Sabalenka on the forehand side, but very rarely she might go off for a game or two, but very rarely does it stay for long. But Sakari, um, I I don't have the same belief in her forehand anywhere near as the as the great forehands through the history of women's tennis. Nowhere near. Yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. Do you think it's a nerves thing? Because it does, it obviously crops up in finals quite badly. Yeah, she doesn't have a good final record. I think even even I can think of some semis that she just doesn't perform well. So I, I think she's one, she's trying to get some mindset training and get some help on the um, psych, sports psychology side of things. Certainly we know Sakari works as hard as anybody. So physically yeah. she's there. You know the desire is there, but sometimes... You know, it takes all of it. It takes everything to come together. The way Ash Barty was able to put it together. It's the, you know, it's the training. It's the physical gifts. It's the mental fortitude. It's being able to produce, most especially under the most amount of pressure, to have your technique hold up. Um, that's why technique is so important for, you know, people who are younger or who have, or parents of young players. Technique is good solid technique that holds up under pressure is about the most important thing in tennis it's, it's interesting though because Sakari and Guadalajara and here by the way at the end of the Sabalenka match saving three break points with great serves and that was a massive thing in Guadalajara the way she served under pressure kick serves out wide on a on a dime like when she needed it big serves down the tee if she needed them the variety from that serve it's like the technique for all those shots is is perfect so it's not like she can't she can perform can't perform under pressure she can it's just for me it seems to be that one shot it just seems to be that one shot that that she has problems with so it's it's unfair to call her a non-pressure player basically Pam is what I'm trying to say yeah well listen um she's still young but the thing is you sort of develop I guess she's middle-aged really for a tennis player's career Mm-hmm. And you do develop the scar tissue of sort of falling short. Um, so I think next year is really important. I, I, as for her compatriot on the ATP side, I think Sitsipas is really faced with the same thing. Like mm-hmm. you, you yeah, just have to be careful that too many matches, you know, slip away in finals or in semis of majors and like that French Open, the first one that Barty won. I mean, maybe since I think it was Sakari who had a pretty good chance there too. Um, you know, I think next yeah. year is really important to have a breakthrough. Not saying she has to win a major, but she has to win some of those close matches in later yeah. stages of majors. Just like she did, as you mentioned, beating Kuder Matova to clinch the last spot, that's yeah. a big match. Now, that's a little untraditional from your normal big match, but I think it was the quarters of Guadalajara. Yeah, it was, yeah, happened. yeah. Um, but... You know, when you realize what was on the line, it was a winner take all. Whoever won that match would get in. The other would be the alternate. That was a big time match and she came through beautifully. So she can do it. Yeah. My, my closing statement on, on Sakura would be last year, her semi-finals record was 1-6. 
This year, you know, it was like 4-1, I believe, 4-2. This year, finals record was about love four, I'm pretty sure. Maybe she'll Next learn. year. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now, it'd be lovely to have that as the ending to our story. Uh, next year, it would be great. Moving on, Pam, because I know you're pushed for time. Sabalenka v. Svontek. We have talked about it a little bit. Just sort of expanding in that a bit. Obviously, ending Svontek's 15-match winning streak against top 10 opposition, which is huge. Svontek maybe not turning up in some departments. But again, the biggest factor for me was that serve. And it's going to be a huge factor if Svontek wants to excel on grass, if he wants to win tournaments like this in the future obviously because the WTA finals is always going to be indoors and Sabalenka and Garcia paving the way for how a serve can make the biggest difference in these conditions and honestly that 6-1 set I think I think that was fair enough in the end to be honest one of the most interesting stats you might like this Pam is that that 6-1 set was only the 14th set of 180 sets played this year which one took failed to break serve so Sabalenka really did have to serve well to, yeah. to stop that from happening. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, uh, what was interesting is Sabalenka started that set with a double fault. And yeah. then you were kind of going, uh-oh. And then honestly, she never looked back. I mean, had service winners both on first serves, second serves. Just literally, I thought it was... Because I saw Spion in the finals of San Diego at a set of piece against Donna Vekic. Played literally, it was, it was one of those six, one of her 22 six love sets. She was impeccable, so precise. I, don't, I think she made one unforced error in that set. Tables turned. This time, indoors, the pressure of Sabalenka's serve. Sabalenka obviously found inspiration. Her serve was right on. And then kind of she, Sabalenka pushed and rushed and took time away from Sviantek. So even then, the forehand broke down. Yeah. By, by Sviantek's standard, her forehand was really subpar. Um, but I think it was because of the pressure from Sabalenka. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Certainly the returns as well. Um, you know, Garcia sends them down the, the middle a lot of the time. I thought Sabalenka did a really good job of keeping them away from Schwantek's forehand or out of the hitting zone of, of Schwantek's forehand at least. And obviously being a if you're able to go into Schwantek's forehand on the serve as well with enough power, you know, it, it, we saw it with Ludmila Samsonova earlier this year. I remember in Stuttgart, that was massive. Anybody who can do that is, is doing well. Just for context, by the way, the second serve of, of Sabalenka, she was averaging it higher than uh, Andre Rublev on the men's tour, just as a, obviously, you know, pace isn't the biggest thing at the end of the day for second serve, but for Sabalenka in this match, it certainly was. So, I mean, it's huge. It, it was a great, great performance. One of the best performances I've seen from the, you know, underarm serving, du self-professed, double fault in queen, you know, of this uh, year. No. Um, uh, listen, it, I, 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 I was working for Tennis Channel that week of Adelaide, and it was really difficult to watch. Like, like the, and I've seen 40 years of service yips by various players. So I've seen it all. I had never seen it so bad as what Sabalenka went through in the lead up to the Australian Open. I actually felt that she, she needed to go home and regroup. But I was wrong because what she ended up doing was pushing forward. Like maybe if it, it, it would have been such a bad decision in hindsight if she'd avoided competition because of the yips. I actually think she was able to work through it better because she just faced it. She just faced her fear. She problem solved, brought in a biomechanics expert, did some tinkering, made the serve, you know, maybe a little less hitchy in a couple areas, maybe had some mantras in her head to think about when she started to feel uneasy, whatever it was, while, it, you know, there's certainly matches during the year where it would ebb and flow the double faults. We saw nothing like we did in Adelaide, nothing. Um, yeah. But there, obviously there's still problems. The two double faults in the tie break, um, you know, in the in the final against Garcia, why they weren't the yips, they were just sort of like those were massive double faults to hit um, with, from a two love lead yeah. in a tie break. It's brutal net picking, isn't it, Pam? But it's literally the only difference that was was made in the end. To give you context behind that, moving on to the final, Sabalenka made twenty nine out of thirty two second serves. I mean, that is by far the biggest percentage you know per second serve hit of a Sabalenka's year in terms of second serves made. And she won a further 25 of those 29 points. So she only 
dropped four second serve points in the final. In the, the final, yeah, in the final, and two of them were the double final. faults in the tiebreak. Yeah, exactly. Ugh, yeah. exactly. I mean, listen, ninety nine percent of the time when Sabalenka plays the quality match that she played the other day on serve, she's probably she's probably going to win the match. I mean, it was just like yep. Garcia was, as I said, it it was just it came down to one point. Yeah, and uh, there's the perfect time to give Caro Garcia some love because we've not talked about her too much yet. Obviously, she was the eventual champion. Such a high level from start to finish. The ability, you know, to spot serve from her. Certainly to mop up on the, the plus one as well. As you say, Coco Goff, take notes. This is what you should be doing. The wide serve in particular for me. I don't, Can you give us any more insight into Caro Garcia's serving at all, Pam? Well, I feel like her whole mindset is just she's just the most aggressive player. Her her whole game is built taking time away. Um, you know, obviously servers love indoors, and you're right, she was spot serving well. Um, when you say the out wide serve, you mean the out wide serve on the deuce side, or on the deuce on the deuce? Yeah, and yeah. that listen, that's my favorite serve of all time. That was the serve from my game that I relied on the most, especially indoors, because I felt like. I didn't have to worry about, you know, looking up and seeing anything that could distract. There was no wind and I could literally slice it and pull it four to five feet up the line from the service line, running away from the mm-hmm. opponent. And it was just like my bread and butter. And I, I, I love to see players that in today's game have the realization, just like a great lefty serve out wide on the, on the ad side, the righty can do the same thing. And I just feel like righties, I've got to learn that that serve has to be worked on. And it's, it's such, you know, to start 15 love most of the time, and I'm not saying it's always going to be because of the wide serve, but then it, if you get that wide serve and you get people kind of having to lean outside, then the the T serve becomes so much easier as well. And and then you can start to really just confuse people and like, Oh my gosh, that's like a server. That's when you're in serving heaven is when you know, the returner just wants to crawl under the indoor surface, go away. Yeah, it's interesting actually because lefties are always credited with being able to use the slider to save break points more often because obviously the majority of your break points are going to come in the ad court, right? But your righties are going to play, anybody's going to play more points in the juice court over the course of any match or you play an equal amount of points you know, in the juice in the ad court, right? Because you're always starting from the juice court. So technically, that righty serve should be more valued, the righty sliding serve. Obviously, you know, if you're playing a fellow righty, it goes into their forehand. Maybe that's where things get a little bit different in terms of advantages, disadvantages, but you're quite right. I mean, it's, it's such a valuable serve. You don't have to smack it. You just have to place it. Um, yeah, and Garcia shows the value of that the, this whole week. What did you think of our transition game as well? Because there was matches was earlier in the week. Oh my God. Yeah, listen, I mean, she attacks uh, serves, and I won't just say second serves. If somebody floats a first serve too short, yeah. she's just ready ready to pounce. All over um, it. Yeah, and I felt like, she, look, she had some things going on off court with her coach, um, Bertrand Perre, leaving um, short time before the championship saying, yeah, you know, he was one that, it wasn't a mutual announcement. It was like, you know, things are too difficult in the camp. So what does she do? She shows up with a, you know, a coach from hers from a while ago or mom or dad, and she goes about her business. And I thought it was like, maybe it even motivated her to um, play well. And I did hear that Pere played a really important part in green lighting Garcia's natural full court offensive press style tennis. Like, you know, it's easy to hear voices like saying, why are you standing in so close? You should be standing further back. You know, yeah. wh- why are you attacking so much? But evidently he kind of said, this is who you are. Go do it. And that kind of, that, and so maybe she took some messages from that period of time where sh- she had him as her coach, even though he wasn't there. And she's like, okay, I'm going to win this thing. And she did. And that was really, really, really great to speak to you, Pam. Honestly, I, I really, really thank I can't thank you enough for coming on. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for Pat, your patience. No absolutely no patience at all. I, I enjoyed every minute, honestly. Pam, thank you very much. Um this has been the online tennis podcast. We'll catch you next time. Thank you very much. Thanks for Cheers. having me, Jack. Bye bye.